Okay, so thank you for coming. Those of you that are here in person, today's uh, December 1st, I believe, uh, 2016, and uh, this is a, a, a review session for the ECE 3030 uh, final exam, which, just let me say uh, at the, uh, up front, is the same format as before, so expect the same genre of questions. That could be good or bad. Um, and also, it's going to be comprehensive. Um, it will be weighted towards the three terminal devices we've been covering over the last several weeks. So it will be weighted towards FETs. Due to Monday's incidents, we, incident, we did not get as far into bipolars, but we'll continue to push bipolars a little bit tomorrow, Friday's lecture, um, before, before uh, we end up the semester. Uh, so it will be weighted towards the field effect transistors, if I were to do a back-of-the-envelope sort of estimation, I'm thinking on the order of one to two problems related to test of midterm one material, maybe two to three. I mean, don't quote me on this. I want to be a little fuzzy on purpose, but maybe two to three towards the, the uh, second midterm material and probably at least uh, four to six or so for the this, this new material. So I want to make sure the new material is tested adequately um, uh, and so forth. With the bipolars being minimally covered, it will um, you know, focus it towards the FETs, obviously, which means that uh, maybe, maybe uh, uh, a chance to go backwards in time a little bit. And I tend to go back, I, I try to look, I don't always, but sometimes I look at where I felt there were weak spots before and sort of address, readdress them as a chance for everyone to, to make good on, on maybe a sour note earlier in the semester. And so then if I see everyone kind of really kick it and hit it at the end, then it really makes me you know, quite generous when I'm giving out letter grades. So <laughs> I kind of want you to, to start off slow and really get into this semiconductor device physics. So hopefully you've seen how it's the same. It's, it's, it takes a while to learn the the device, the, 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 the inner dynamics of the carrier uh, carriers and, and the physics and so forth. But now you're starting to see us apply a lot of the same rules of thumb. And so, so hopefully it starts to just kind of flow a little bit. And so I, I understand the beginning can be very mysterious and so forth. Okay, um, so I'm going to get started. Again, the same format. I'm going to go through the PDFs um, and hit the highlights where I think I really uh, uh, want to put emphasis. Solicit you for questions. You can interrupt me uh, as I go on. As I get to the end, then I'll open it up more for questions to the floor. So obviously coming here in person gives you greater one-on-one -on -one opportunity to challenge me on things. Um, so, and those of you who didn't make it, I uh, hope you're uh, nice in your pajamas at home. Um, so, this is the, uh, the first slide deck that I presented you with, um, and I tried to point out to you, you know, what a transistor was right from the beginning. And now you're start, hopefully starting to see, we've got a source, we've got a drain, we've got a gate, we've got a channel in between, and we're looking for, we're assuming that these are highly conductive, highly doped, and so therefore we're just looking at what conditions are modulating this channel to make it highly conductive, and I've given this kind of cute analogy that it's kind of like going to Vegas and getting three cherries on the slot machine. When this thing becomes highly conductive due to the application of the gate, uh, then that becomes conductive and we get uh, flow. So this is a variable resistor, essentially, and in the uh, circuit analysis type of uh, situation, if you do a SPICE model or you do, uh, you know, Thevenin and Norton equivalents and so forth, essentially an FET is a dependent current source dependent upon voltage, right? It's a voltage dependent current source, right? And, and so dependent upon the gate voltage. So let's go through the, uh, I'm going to jump forward uh, just to to point out, uh, to, to calibrate everyone. We had the, I'll come back to this, but you know, the first midterm was this 
Uh, this old uh, 331 legacy material uh, that was the foundation. And then we got into the uh, last midterm was the uh, PN junctions and PN junction applications, the segment uh, two and three from 432. So where I'm starting, just to be clear, is the segment four field effect transistors, FETs. And then we'll go into BJTs uh, minimally at the end. So I'm going to be in segment four here. So that is this. So this is when we kind of graduate from the two terminal devices to the three terminal devices. And um, so again, it's a voltage controlled current source. And uh, again, these are some other uh, guideposts, uh, other, other visuals showing the source drain. This is a little more scaled version of a field effect transistor. This happens to be Texas Instruments. Uh, 90, 1997, and uh, and so then we end up with the uh, circuit symbol, obviously, and this is a gate a voltage uh, controlled current source. We end up with our family of curves. We call that the family of curves, and you can see that it's gate dependent uh, output of the uh, of the drain source current, and so as we modulate the gate, we're turning it on and off. And it goes through this variable resistor zone, this triode regime, and then we end up with the saturation eventually. And um, this is a little more realistic FET. We'll get into this later, but this is a little more realistic as you start to, to shrink things down and, uh, and so forth. Okay, so... Uh, as you recall from some of the oxidation diffusion that I uh, presented you with on the fundamentals, um, this, this uh, gate dielectric is extremely thin. This is the gate, this is the channel, and so we have to be cognizant of that as we go forward. There is a material science challenge, and we'll see that later. And, um, uh, like, this is one of the things, and this is related to your computer problem, is the scaling of that gate dielectric whereas the um, traditional SiO2 scaled to 1.2 nanometers, and I think it got as small as 0.8 nanometers before they finally segued over to, yeah, here's the 0.8, before they finally segued over to the high K dielectric. Um, so this is actually what you see I use as my YouTube backdrop uh, uh, banner uh, photo or so. And this really captures it. And so you really have to just be cognizant of this equation. And to me, you're either, and I like this visual that comes from the ITRS, which probably uh, has some intel and, 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 and influence, uh, where it's really the, the mobility. Um, you're, either doing, you're either doing mobility. Well, you're, you're doing the old school in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were... Uh, industry was modulating this, the W over L. They were reducing LG then in the hopes of reducing VDD, and that would scale a little bit the power, and that would improve the performance, and this is what you saw for many generations. Now they've started, since the high-K dielectric uh, in introduction, they're now uh, dealing with this uh, portion, or, uh, the numerator, before they were just dealing with the denominator, the thickness of the oxide. And so now they're tailoring this entirely, and that's also reducing. So you're, you're doing both concurrently, and it's really only the last, um, uh, since around the 45 nanometer uh, node, that they've really started to deal with the numerator there. Okay, so it's, a, it's this variable resistor. We're looking for a, uh, and I just uh, did a, uh, a visitation to a 3020 class. You've all had 3020, right? Okay, so I, I just did. Okay, so I just did a visit to a 3020 class, and they were showing some of this, and that's kind of the chicken and egg uh, uh, with this with this material. As you start to see it in its circuit application, I think a little bit in 3020, and so you have this load line analysis where this unknown device that has expresses this uh, IV characteristic, current voltage characteristic, uh, has a power supply and a resistor, and so then this becomes the load, and this is the driver, and so when you do a load line analysis, that ends up being the intersection point. That is the, the, um, the uh, uh, bias point at which that circuit will want to, uh, to manifest itself. 
So what we're looking for is this device where I can, with a third terminal, modulate this curve up and down into the family of curves where I can shift that bias point from a, a high to a low and be able to basically do digital logic. Right. That's, the, that's the digital information age. So here you see it's modulating, uh, moving through, and uh, we're able to capture uh, a, uh, this, this three-terminal device. This is um, a lot of uh, lexicon of the different uh, families of field effect transistors, and there's different ways. They all embody the same uh, properties. They're basically having a gate that's modulating a channel, which is connected uh, to a source and a drain. It's just whether you're modulating the channel with a junction, so it's a PN junction with a depletion region, or it's a metal semiconductor, where it's the, you still have the depletion region, but it's a Schottky barrier, whether it's a, a MOSFET like we've seen, where you have a dielectric, and it's just the electrostatics across this, uh, this MOS capacitor, or whether it's a MISFET, where it's a generic insulator rather than an oxide insulator. Uh, so it's essentially, here's the definition, it's a uh, majority carriers are emitted by the source, collected by the drain, and the output currents modulated by the third terminal called the gate. And the gate controls the current flow through a channel by either modulating the resistivity or modulating the, um, the, uh, the, the charge in there, the, the carrier's presence, and the gate voltage uh, controls that impedance. A modfet is another one uh, that we talked about a little bit. We did get a glimpse of that when we talked about heterojunctions, heterojunction P injunctions. Um, so, uh, in the early development, they uh, a lot of times uh, books will use the JFET uh, topology to show you how this P N junction has a depletion region, and that's going to encroach on this channel in this manner. And so that's fine. I'm not going to expect you to derive anything on the, on the exam. I just want you to explain. Remember Bloom's taxonomy of learning or, you know, describe, define, um, you know, those kind of questions are what's going to be on here. So I'm not going to have you, you know, drive these, these uh, IV characteristics and equations and things like that or even calculate them with a calculator and things like that. But understanding how the channel is, 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 uh, is impeded because we have uh, uh, voltages and, and, and uh, electric fields in parallel in, 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 in this uh, lateral version and also uh, 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 in the vertical. And so when we have these two bias conditions, we end up having the, the depletion region is becoming trapezoidal and it's basically uh, pinching off the channel. And so kind of an understanding how this is changing the variable resistance. And so the slope, the tangent of that, is starting to, to, to bend over as the res channel resistance goes up. And then eventually we hit the saturation point where this is pinched off. And therefore, the carriers that have entered the channel can't just mysteriously say, I'm going to go back because the channel closed. They're already past the point of no return. So the channel. Uh, the current does not go to zero but uh, when the channel pinches off, but it's just that there's no continue, uh, continued increase in the current. So the current that's uh, injected continues to go, and you end up with the saturation that levels off. So here you see the, uh, the family of curves where you have the pinch off, and so in here uh, beyond we say that's in saturation. Um, so then we talk about, the, here it is, the derivation, which will not be expected on the uh, exam, uh, differential resistance, breaking it up uh, into these parts and looking at the differential resistance. So this gives you some overtones as to how the, that uh, FET equation was uh, derived. Um, so you end up with um, one of the takeaways from this slide. Let me bring this up to higher magnification. Uh, one of the things here would be, where is it? Ah, yeah. Would be GM, the transconductance. So in that, uh, you're going to have it's a dependent current source, 
essentially, and there's going to be uh, that is generally the flavor of an FET. This is the heart of an FET. It's going to be a dependent current source uh, where the, it's dependent on the gate voltage and the magnitude of the amplification is given by this transconductance, uh, which is essentially um, a figure of merit where it's the delta IBS over delta VGS. So it's the ratio of the uh, drain source current modul modulated by the gate source. So uh, to demystify it, we are essentially talking about what is the difference between these, these curves. Right? So here this is a one volt in the denominator. We would say this is one volt increments. And this, is, this showing shows from here to here I have the larger amount of gain because uh, that's the larger modulation with the same increments of gate voltage, right? So that shows that between zero and minus one volts, I'm at a higher gain opportunity. And the gain is, is, is falling off as I go to more <coughs> negative voltages. Um, so then I introduced uh, to try to modernize, and again, I was tickled pink uh, when I was part of a PhD uh, p uh, qualifying exam recently from a, the circuit area, where they're trying to teach their circuit uh, students these fundamentals because this is missing from our from our uh, foundational classes. So I was really uh, uh, tickled that that uh, I'm giving you a better education, perhaps. In, uh a, uh, an insight as to how it actually happens. And it's this barrier model that isn't well represented, I find, in some of these traditional textbooks. So this is kind of what we saw before. This is kind of rehashing. And the pinch off and, and, this, and the saturation. And, uh, oh, this will come up later, but we also have the velocity saturation. Remember the, in the uh, midterm one material when we were talking about carrier motion and we had uh, a velocity saturation of, of just free carriers moving through a crystal. We didn't really have a device built yet. That was midterm two and this three terminal stuff. We just had carriers and we had that Felix Baumgartner effect where carriers are going through and hitting the lattice and hitting phonons and so forth. And so we end up with this velocity saturation. So the same thing as happens though in a transistor because when they leave the source, they're ramping up through a, a, a volt uh, through the electric field. They're ramping up their velocity, and eventually the carriers hit the saturation velocity, and they continue through the channel at that velocity, unless there's some velocity overshoot, some ballistic transport. But the assumption is that they're they're colliding. There's collisions with the lattice and so forth that will bring this to to this saturation velocity, and. Um, so we end up with the velocity saturation. When you have velocity saturation, you tend to see that the gain flattens out. And so here you can see the family of curves are all fairly equally spaced. So that is representative of the fact that the gain over that whole uh, bias range is fairly flat. And so that, and that was indicative of the velocity saturation. Um, so the thing I was trying to introduce to modernize this was to introduce at the undergraduate level the barrier model. And this is really how things, and as we're going into these ultra-scaled CMOS, this is actually much more important. This is maybe a better way of thinking of it. And it actually builds, I think, naturally upon the way we think about the PN junction barrier, the contact potential barrier that holds back the charge. So here we essentially have the source and the drain that are both highly doped. So the Fermi level is, is where it is uh, because these are filled with the, we're going to assume this is n-type, I guess. So we're going to assume it's filled with electrons. And we have a p-type channel. And until we invert it, uh, it's, the barrier doesn't come down. So I recognize that we have that barrier. And then as we put the bias in the two directions, not only on the gate source, but on the drain source, then also 
the, uh, this bias goes down because the drain relative to the source changes. And so we have that barrier. And, that how the, and so by applying the gate, the proper way to think about it is I'm lowering that barrier, allowing these carriers to escape. And remember, from the midterm two material, sorry, the carriers are piled up. This is showing on the camera. Uh, yeah, I guess so. So remember that this is the carriers are piled up in that way. So it's bringing these carriers up over the barrier. And that's where the carriers are in the conduction band. Remember, this is bounded by the Fermi Dirac on the, on the one side, uh, Fermi Dirac, and the density of states on the other. And that's why we have this, this lobe, this, what we sometimes refer to as a sail. So that sail is trying to launch carriers over there. So you just have to... So band diagrams are so important. I had you draw. How many band diagrams did I have you draw in last midterm? Four? Up, four? up to four. Up to four. Up to four. You could, have, you could have done more. So that's how important band diagrams are, right? That was four out of ten problems you had to do to launch one band, uh, band diagram. Here's another one. This is basically showing you the, the barrier. I mean, if you understand what the barriers are, where the carriers are, you understand where the carriers are not, you got all the physics to be able to rationalize what's going to go on. That's all you need to know. And um, so here the carriers are coming across, barriers lowering, and we end up uh, uh, having a nice uh, transistor. But when we start to bias even more and more, we get the influence of the bias over here is pulling this down prematurely and things start to, to fall apart as we make it smaller and smaller and smaller. And so as we go into the barrier control transport is re responsible for the shape of the MOSFET. And this is what you, you see, the, the skewing of this from its, uh, from its ideal situation is actually based a lot on this. And uh, so uh, here we have the, the pinch off. I think we come back to that a little bit later, so let me hold that thought. Threshold voltage. I need to emphasize threshold voltage. Threshold voltage is very, very important as well, probably very testable, um, because it's what is the threshold voltage? The threshold voltage is the, is, the, is the voltage necessary to induce that channel, to induce that third cherry. So understanding the dynamics, and that kind of goes back to midterm one material, um, where you're just looking at uh, the charge neutrality equation. You're basically on what condition have you inverted the channel, right? At what point do I make that p-type material n-type because I've essentially moved the Fermi level, right? And so if you know the Fermi level, you can actually use the midterm one equations to, get to, to calculate what the concentra carrier concentration is. So uh, here's a nice schematic again of an FET, but... Uh, um, so what happens as we make FET smaller? Let's come back to that theme. I think this is where the slides pick up again on that. Uh, so the short channel effects, uh, that kind of talks about the, the, set, the mobility set, uh, uh, velocity saturation here. This is the same thing that I was just telling you where the velocity um, saturation leads to the gain being uh, constant. Um, so then if you talk about, right, remember, this is midterm one material. How do carriers move? They either move by drift or diffusion, right? And drift is driven by uh, the electric field and the availability of carriers, and diffusion is driven by the concentration gradient. And, um, and so the velocity saturation. And so here's the ballistic, this is, again, an effort to try and modernize this is where things are going to the ballistic limit, where we're shrinking transistors down below 100 nanometers. Carriers are coming across this barrier. Here's the carriers with all their kind of representing this sail in a way. This is a different version of it. And so remember, over here, there's diffusion. Carriers have a 50-50 chance of going left or right. And some, some come across. And if they come across and splatter over this barrier, uh, they have the higher energy then the electric field will sweep them down. And 
There's an opportunity for scattering, for collision with the lattice, with other carriers, with phonons, and so forth. But what happens when this distance is so short that the characteristic diffusion length, remember we have ln, we have tau n, these go hand in hand. I was saying this in lecture yesterday, but let me make sure I say this in the review session and get this on videotape. This is the average, ln is the average distance an electron will go travel in its drunkard walk before it recombines, right? ln is the distance it goes. That's the average distance. And tau n is the time it takes. These are saying the same thing. One is in, in uh, space and the other is in time, right? And so what I'm saying is if an ln, the average time to scatter, is longer than this source drain distance, the gate length, then the carriers can actually go off, go across without any scattering. And that's referred to as the ballistic regime. So they're ballistically going across. There's no scattering. In fact, technically, when that happens, they can exceed the saturation velocity. Because the saturation velocity is assuming collisions are moderating the velocity. And without any collisions, there's no moderation. The velocity can exceed the speed limit. So this is how you get... Uh, uh, so, so this can be somewhat beneficial, perhaps. But you'll see other things where it's going to... See, here's the velocity. Velocity saturation is ostensibly, in this case, 10 to the 17... Uh, 10 to the 7, sorry, centimeters per second. But these carriers are coming across in this ballistic way, and so they're actually speeding up and exceeding the speed limit, which can be a good thing. But uh, due to uh, things like uh, later, we got a little bit into it. Uh, let me jump ahead because this is a nice visual. We do get later into things like dra uh, drain-induced barrier lowering, where we realize that the voltage in this direction between the source drain is tethered to the gate source and that this barrier is being modulated by that. And as these channels get very small, um, this one might be a little better uh, visual. So as this is coupled, this is lowering the barrier prematurely. We call that drain-induced barrier lowering, or dibble. Um, And that is talked about in Streetman, and I find that the barrier uh, barrier model is, uh, is is really helps you understand Dibble. Uh, I think when you read it in the textbook and so forth and go through, uh, it seems a little mysterious. And all it is is the fact that this is electrostatically. And if you think of this barrier model, this will make much more perfect sense to you. And this is a real effect that really is a, a, is, is a problem with uh, modern transistors, scaled transistors. Um, okay, so MESFETs, just to round out to your education, we were exposed you to the, the, uh, the, the Schottky-based uh, field effect transistors. And often these are using the 3.5 materials with high mobilities. Gallium arsenide has a mobility. So... Silicon has a mobility uh, at 300 Kelvin uh, electron mobility of about 1,500 centimeters squared per volt second. And mobility of uh, gallium arsenide at 300 Kelvin is ostensibly 8,500 8, centimeters squared per volt second. So this is one of the reasons I would want to use this. So it, it, it um, will consume more power, but I'm going to use this for uh, uh, LNAs. I'm going to use this for, for various, various amplifiers. Power, uh, for, for, you know, this, you'll use several of these in your cell phone, for instance, for some of the amplifier circuits, for some of the transmitter circuits. Uh, so it has a very high power added efficiency for linear amplification, for instance, as I say here. Um, so it's very similar. Uh, do go back to that Felix Baumgartner effect where you have the impurity and last scattering. That, that drives you where 
as you put more carriers in, um, Where was it? Oh, yeah, it was, it was the beginning of this slide. No. So, uh, in here we have the uh, uh, the the, the uh, IV characteristics for the transistor, and so one of the things is we need carriers in there. To, to modulate. Um, in fact, maybe it's a little more represented in, in uh, I think I went past it. Going too fast. Where is it? Pardon me. I'm having trouble finding the one slide I want. So remember, the amount of current we get out is related to this drift or diffusion. So we're going to assume that when the ch carriers go get into the channel, they're going to be uh, amp uh, accelerated by the electric field and, and drift. So what is the amount of carriers that are moving? <coughs> it's not so much the strength of the electric field, because the dimensions and the voltages are somewhat constrained. It's the availability of the carriers. So we're looking for, so the you know, electric field is somewhat bounded. The mobility is bounded by the materials choice you have. Q is just a constant. It's the number of carriers that we have. And so in field effect transistors, one of the things they want to do is they want to put more charge into the channel because you get a bigger bang for the buck. Because what is transconductance? It's delta IDS over delta VDS, right? So I can get a larger current modulation if I have more charge in the channel, right? If the channel can accommodate a larger, so I want a fire hose, not a garden hose, right? That's all it really is. I want more N. Okay, so the reason I come back to that is that is basically one of the drivers for the mess fed is I want lots of charge in there, so I want to dope it a lot. But as I dope it, I get diminishing returns because the, uh, the, the lattice scattering leads to an attenuation of the mobility. So as I put more charge in N, the uh, mobility starts to go down, and so the, the product, uh, I start to, to, to shoot myself in the foot. So, um, so ModFETs solve that. So a MESFET is good, it's useful, it has application, and it's used in your cell phones. A ModFET would be a higher-end uh, transistor, probably used for uh, more uh, uh, high-end applications, certainly in a satellite communication. You're going to want to use it there. And that's where you, have, you can have your cake and eat it, too. You can have high mobility and large charge for the channel. And it's essentially using quantum wells. It's called modulation doping is the terminology I, I prefer, where you're doping here but the carriers go there. It's, it's, it's a, they're spatially separated. And if you remember the midterm one material, if I trained you well <coughs> enough, these, I, the, the, you don't get carriers for free. They leave ionized donors and acceptors behind. So they, and those lead to the scattering events. So here, I've spatially separated, so I'm able to have car free carriers Without the uh, inhibit being inhibited by the ionized donor sites that are going to lead to scattering. So this is a pristine crystal, and I'm using quantum mechanics where I formed this quantum well due to the heterojunction. And that's basically midterm one material. So go back to the heterojunction. But I formed this heterojunction. In in the big picture, remember that's a snapshot. It gets a little, uh, but we essentially have. This is really kind of what what it, what it is. Maybe it's something like that. And so what they're showing you is just this part. But here we have a valence band, 
And here we have a conduction band. And this is basically going to be aluminum gallium arsenide, perhaps. And this will be just gallium arsenide. So this is the wide band gun material, and we get that heterojunction discontinuity. So I think sometimes when you just show that triangle, um, you're kind of wondering mysteriously where it's coming from. It's a heterojunction of a wider band gap and a lower band gap where you get those discontinuities. This is the delta EC we learned about in midterm one. So just recognize the context of everything. So that's what that is on the right. Um, okay, so let's bring our, so that's enough of the uh, three five devices that uh, we're gonna expose you to for 3030. Now we come back to the MOSFET and we, we uh, drill down to the specifics of the MOS capacitor. And the MOS capacitor is really the heart of the device. If you understand this, you really start to understand the, um, the, 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 the operation. And so it starts off with we have an MOS. And what are we doing here? This is a band diagram, just to make sure you, we're, we're explicitly clear. We are essentially taking a virtual cut. Now that you've been exposed to a little bit of TCAD through your computer problem, we're essentially taking a cut, a virtual cut through this device vertically from the metal of the, of the gate through the oxide of the, of the gate dielectric to the semiconductor. And through that, we do an MOS and we look at the band diagram. So it's the band diagram through that MOS. Here's the band diagram. So we're going to idealize it like we have did before. We usually just idealize it and then we paint over at the top with the fine, uh, finer touches. So for illustrative purposes, we're going to say that the metal work function and the semiconductor work function are at ideal, uh, 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 equal. And we have this oxide in the middle. And they're all indexed to the vacuum level. And so therefore, they end up with this kind of a band diagram. So a proper MOSFET should be that the gate is electrically isolated uh, from the channel. So that there's the oxide acts as a, as a blockade, right? And we don't want this to be leaky. That's why the scaling of the gate dielectric became problematic, because this, this became porous and allowed carriers to flow. But we want this to be a, an energy barrier. And so we want this to be nothing more, and, and, and to not lose sight of the, uh, the big picture, Remember, this gate is going to be modulating by external bias up or down. It's going to be like taking a carpet in, in, in a hallway, you know, like a runway carpet in a, a long hallway, and it's just like lifting it up or lifting it down. And it's going to be raising this up and raising this down relative to that in some sense. So here we are. We're, we're pulling the uh, rug down. We're pulling it up and so forth. So here... If we pull it down, then um, so the, uh, the, 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 the semiconductor is raising with, re with respect to the metal. And when it does that, that means that the Fermi level is going to increase relative to the EI, the center point, the EG over 2 point, we're going to say. And so therefore, uh, this P-type material is becoming less P-type. And I've always kind of emphasized what's the degree of freedom here. This is one of your Schottky diode uh, problems on the second midterm. So what's the degree of freedom? If I have a p-type material and it needs to be made less p-type, well, I have holes. Uh, I can either accumulate more holes or I can push the holes away. And pushing the holes away means that I become more electron-rich, right? More, more hole-poor. And whole poor in a p-type material means depletion region. So I'm forming a depletion region. So if you rationalize all these fundamentals out, you should be able to, to convince yourself uh, that this is a depletion region. This depletes, and therefore the bands bend due to the application of charge. So through the Gauss's law, the, 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 uh, the depletion region, this rectangle of charge, leads to a quadratic uh, shift in the energies, right? Uh, constant, constant doping leads to linear electric field, leads to a squared 
quadratic uh, 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 potential, and that's what you see here, right? It's just Gauss's law. We do the opposite. We go into accumulation, where now we've, we've uh, pulled this uh, in the opposite way, and now uh, the Fermi level is coming closer to the valence band, so p-type material is becoming more p-type, and so, remember, p-type material has lots of holes rattling around, so the degree of freedom there to make it more p-type is just to pile, a shovel a lot of holes into that quantum well. So this becomes a triangular quantum well housed with holes. But that doesn't help me with my transistor because I still have... I still have source, drain, uh, and gate, and that's the oxide. So I still have this being p-type, n plus, n plus, right? This just becomes more p-type by the accumulation of holes. So I have a cherry, a cherry, and a lemon, right? I'm not going to win. So that's accumulation. So that doesn't really buy me anything. The big thing is when I go past depletion. When I push it harder, the Fermi level pierces the EI point, e.g. over 2. Fermi level, we know mathematically, uh, when it's above the EI point, means that it's n-type. And so how do I make p-type material n-type? It's because I've inverted it. Because I've now taken all those piece, uh, all those uh, n sub p's, the minority electrons on the p side, and aggregated them, right? I have a finite number of them, always. We have the intrinsic carry concentration of that semiconductor, and we have the PP, which will be the acceptor doping level. So I always have a finite number of electrons in my p material, and here I have accumulated them, and I've shoveled them and corralled them into that triangle. That becomes my electron-rich channel. Then I have my three cherries, three cherries, right? So go to Vegas for, for the holidays, maybe. And we end up with the Gauss's law, right? We count the charge. We have a depletion region. Superimposed on the depletion region is this very thin channel. And that's being balanced by the charge on the surface of the gate metal. And so the electric field looks like it's discontinuous, but it's not. It's just extremely abrupt. And so we end up with the potential um, barrier that's there. So yeah, this is a better illustration, perhaps. So uh, then we have the, the, one, the second equ equation that I've asked you to impart to memory. I've only asked you to memorize two equations all semester. The, the, um, uh, the condition for... Uh, uh, the inversion, and that's going to be the, um, the basically the, the making the making the surface as n-type as it is p-type in the in the bulk. So this is a measure. This phi f is a measure of how p-type this material is in the substrate. Right? It's how far the EF level is below the EG over two. EI point. So that becomes my yardstick, and when this bends far enough down that it measures to that, when this bends to that point, then it has bent to phi f, and, uh, and therefore, so the surface is now 2 phi f, and I consider that strong inversion, and strong inversion is when we define that we've hit the threshold voltage. So. Um, do I miss anything here? Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, let's say that again. Okay, so then we end up with the, uh, the capacitances. Are, are acute. We have two capacitances. We have the capacitance due to, we have the capacitance of the, of the charge on the gate to the rectangular depletion region, we have the, uh, which, which, is, which grows and grows and then hits a maximum. And then we have the, the, char the additional charge on the gate that, that balances the channel once the channel forms, once we hit the, the strong inversion. So remember, this didn't manifest until first. Until, until later. 
So if I were to draw that, we would end up with the depletion region would grow, it would grow, it would grow, it would grow. Eventually it would hit WM, it would hit its maximum. And then at that point, I would start to create a channel and the channel would grow and grow and grow. And so then the aggregate would be this waveform that you're seeing here. There. So that's how it grows. It grows that way, hits a maximum, and then this spike starts to form. Right. And so that means I have two capacitances. I've got the depletion capacitance and I've got the, ch the, the capacitance to the, to, to the channel. And the carriers in the channel are bound by generation recombination statistics. These are ionized donors or acceptors, depending on what flavor of FET. So those don't really add and subtract instantaneously. These charges are due to the free carriers generated by generation recombination statistics. Remember, the minority carriers are always dominated by generation recombination. They either appear or disappear, depending upon the thermally thermal rates. So that governs the time constants of that. So that's what you see here is we get the one capacitance due to the depletion region growing and then as the channel starts to form we get two capacitors uh, in series and so two capacitors in series uh, 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 are like resistors adding in parallel so the overall capacitance drops. So this dip is indicative of um, going into channel inversion. And then eventually the, uh, it, it comes back depending upon the frequency. So we end up with the different frequencies where at uh, low frequency the generation recombination statistics basically overcome and hide and eventually that disappears. But at higher frequencies uh, it stays low because uh, the generation recombination statistics cannot keep up uh, as quickly. So we have the two capacitors. One, one has more of a time constant associated with it due to the generation combination statistics. Okay, non-ideal deviations from ideality. We can have, uh, we assumed in the first point that the work functions were the same. Well, obviously it is different by the choice of metal I use here. It's different by the choice of doping I have there because it's indexed to the Fermi level. So that's obviously going to drive it. So here is the, uh, the, work, uh, the difference between the work functions M, M, uh, phi ms is depending upon the doping. And so we can modulate that. And so here we can have situations where a transistor actually could be in inversion uh, where there's no bias applied to the gate, right? So this is, could be a normally on field effect transistor. And we have to apply voltage to bring it back to the flat band condition. So, um, so then we have all that interface state charge, which is maybe better shown here, where I, where I can have charges that are mobile ions moving around, like the sodium potassium, I can have oxide trap charge, where I have defects in my oxide, I can have oxide fixed charge. Uh, I can have interface trap charge due to maybe dangling bonds or, or uh, contaminants. And so all these different sources lead to an overall cue of undesired charge at, near this interface. And that, that QI, the aggregate charge, undesired charge, you can never avoid it, uh, adds another term on the, on the uh, uh, on the equation, and yeah, here it is. So then now that original uh, voltage, uh, threshold voltage term, we originally had 2 phi F, and then now we have these additional, and the, and the uh, depletion capacitance related to the capacitance, we now have two additional terms, which is all this messy charge, and then we have the difference in the work function. So we end up with the four terms. Um, so understand that. I would say the takeaway is being able to you know, 
be able to draw these band diagrams, for instance, is, is one very uh, uh, possible type of a question. Draw the three conditions uh, for uh, uh, MOS, you know, mo for a MOSFET, for the band diagrams, things like that. Being able to explain what's going on um, would be it. Uh, uh, Yeah, and then you can see the fl a flat band condition moves back and forth with the bias. Uh, this this sloshing around, by the way, I do that mobile charge. So the mobile charge has sort of a hysteresis; it moves back and forth. That even has a memory effect from where what where it was biased before. So it's moved, shifting that CV curve. So this shift allows me to electrically measure how much mobile charge I have. The shift is, is indic in indicative of the amount of charge, mobile charge I have. Um, and so here's the four terms again. Some of them, this is always negative, negative. This is depending upon the flavor, plus or minus, so they tend to have that aggregate. Um, yeah, okay. Talk about that. Uh, the tunneling, then, uh, as we as we go to smaller dimensions, we have the ability to tunnel through the oxide, right? And so that leads to some problems, like some short channel effects, um, you know, some scaling effects. Let me say it that way. So here's the key MOSFET. Uh, di um, we're not going to do driving equations. I think I've showed you the, the the main equation. Again, GM is down here. I already drew it on the board is the delta IDS over the delta VGS. That's the, uh, capturing the gain. Um, and yeah, so we're back to this. Um, idealized. And then we can see we can make uh, P-channel, N-channel transistors. We can do the complementary. And from that, and based upon the, uh, the, the uh, modulation of the threshold voltage, I can make them enhancement, normally off, normally on. I can adjust the threshold voltage and move that back and forth. And so we end up with the transfer characteristics. It shows the, the GM, the gain, that's this function of gate bias. We can see the current, IDS, is a function of gate bias. So we can see how much usable current we have at maximum gain. Uh, yeah, so here's complementary where I have, say, my NMOS technology, my PMOS technology. These are the transistors I have in my toolbox if I'm a circuit designer. So I might need to make this transistor, tw uh, this PMOS transistor, twice as large so, uh, in my inverter so that this can current match these two. So in an inverter circuit, I need this to match the amount of current. So I might need to make this twice as wide so that they, they match, right? And uh, yeah, so here's, here's an end channel, and then you start to, to, to build it up into an integrated circuit. How do you engineer the threshold voltage? This is uh, often another source of uh, uh, questions. I want to be able to manipulate it because I, a circuit designer needs 25% of this, 25% of that, 25% of that, 25% of that, perhaps, all on the same chip. So I need to make some PMOS, MEN-MOS, and adjust the threshold voltage. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to look at my threshold voltage terms. i got four terms. Um, I'm probably going to, uh, well, one thing, I'm probably using a similar metal for most, so I can shift that. Uh, but the doping is going to be one thing, and so that's going to change. So I can control, I can control the amount. Like I can control, the, I can use a silicon gate, which makes the phi ms term manageable. But that's going to change both PMOS and NMOS. I can control CI by scaling CI by making it smaller. We've talked about that story before. That can control it. But again, that's affecting both PMOS and NMOS sort of equally. Um, which is an important part of the story. 
But I can do ion implantation. That's very selective. So I can actually protect 75% uh, of the transistors with photoresist, and I can do an implantation to 25% of the transistors and deliver a charge to adjust the uh, threshold voltage. So I can manipulate a, por a portion of the population of transistors and get that menagerie that a circuit designer wants. And I can tailor that very well. We saw that in, in the... Uh, in the um, yeah, we saw that in the ion implantation where I'm tailoring and delivering a dose. I'm delivering it precisely at the interface, and so I can do that uh, and adjust the threshold voltage. So this one's uh, adjusting threshold voltage in this, in this particular manifestation. Another one, though, uh, kind of using the same uh, uh, um, curve is the high frequency is where we're trying to get the source and the drain to line right up with the doping. So we use the gate uh, as a mask to deliver dose so that the source drains are exactly extended. Um, so that makes a better device. That one is here. Here we're delivering. So we don't want this overlap. This overlap um, leads to a capacitive slowing of the device. So we can implant right through the gate and deliver and extend source drain extensions and make sure that I, I, I don't, because if I don't extend, this will be highly doped, a cherry in Las Vegas. This will be a cherry in Las Vegas. My channel will be a cherry, but I'll have these insulator regions in between. So I've sandwiched a couple lemons in between, so it doesn't work. So I need this to be continuous. And so by doing boron implantation through the gate, I can exactly align the edge of that source to the edge of the gate. So this is a self-aligned process, which is really robust. And I like to emphasize some of these key innovations. By the way, for well, what to study for, I like to emphasize some of these key innov technology innovations that have led to scalable MOSFETs. So this is, say, one, things like the high-K dielectric story uh, that we're coming to is another one. Um, so I can adjust the threshold voltage. Adjusting the substrate bias is another one. Uh, this, is, this comes up and will be more and more important going forward, so I want to make sure that you guys are armed for the future. This 60 to 70 millivolts per decade, this is how you uh, uh, plot the steep subthreshold slope of a transistor. You're, you're plotting it as a function of gate voltage, uh, the, the drain uh, current uh, on a semi-log plot. And you see this period, uh, this, this area that's fairly linear in a semi-log plot. And this is usually limited to seven, 60, to, actually the speed limit is 60 millivolts per decade. And that is our barrier model. This is the, the, the carrier distribution coming over. And the fact that this is a finite distribution <laughs> through the Fermi-Drac statistics means that I can only lower this barrier and turn this car these carriers on and no faster than 60 millivolts per decade. And that's the big challenge going forward is that I don't want a sloppy transistor that goes like that. I want to move to lower operating voltage, I want it to be more like that bipolar. I want it to be, I want to be able to use, bring it up into saturation over a, a lower voltage range. I don't want to have to bring it all the way out to two volts to run, because if I have to run two volts on my cell phone, I'm going to burn up my battery. I want to run it at half a volt. So this is the innovations you'll be seeing coming, is how can I exceed the 60 millivolt per decade uh, subthreshold slope? And that's, that's a fundamental physics because of the Fermi-Drac statistics, the sale that I've tried to impart upon you so many times. One way you can exceed that, by the way, is if I quantum mechanically tunnel. You've seen quantum mechanical tunneling. What if I tunnel into the channel? So I put a tunnel diode there. That's another one way you've, we've, we've seen people exceeding.
So it's a dependent current source. That should be a, a, a parallelogram, right? It's a dependent current source. This is your transistor, all the associated resistances, capacitances, and so forth. But the heart of it is GMVG. So further scaling, we have the high case solution. I think I beat that one to death, hopefully, but I'll just talk about it sparingly here. We want to replace that gate oxide, that CI, with a high K dielectric, so we're modulating the permittivity now. So SiO2, scaling of SiO2 has petered out around the, um, uh, what was it, the 90 nanometer node is when it was introduced. And so here we see, we went from SiO2 in 1990 to the high K solution in the uh, late 2003 time frame. Intel was the first on the market. And this is essentially what we're trying to do. We call the, this the electrical oxide uh, thickness, the, uh, sorry, the equivalent oxide thickness, EOT, of this is the same as this. This has the same amount of capacitance because this is uh, finite thickness at k equals 1. This is double the thickness at k equals 2, so the 2's cancel each other out in the numerator and denominator. And so electrically, from an electrical point of view, this is as uh, robust as this. And so now that thin tunneling barrier, that, that thin, uh, thin gate oxide is no longer a, tun a tunneling barrier. Uh, where the carriers are sloshing back and forth. Remember, I want the gate to be electrically isolated from the channel, and now this is bringing it farther apart, uh, which means the tunneling and things like that are not l less likely to happen. So they went through um, increasing that by going to the high permittivity. MOSFET scaling, we have hot electrons coming in, right? If they're coming in ballistically across here with such high energy, they're coming in hot, we call them hot electrons. And they can scatter, they go up to the dielectric, they break bonds. They're actually moving in the EK diagram, they're coming in hot. So think about that. The lightly doped drain um, uh, reduces some of the uh, effects. Um, Drain-induced barrier lowering. I didn't, used, to, used to never emphasize this as much because the book didn't do it very as, as well. But since I've started to introduce this barrier uh, modeling, uh, uh, barrier model, um, this actually becomes more invoked. Uh, so drain-induced barrier lowering is the electrostatic coupling of the drain to the source through this barrier. And so I think that uh, explains it a lot better. Hot carrier effects, yeah, so, um, and uh, I didn't really go into the solutions. We didn't really have as much time to go in, but understand drain-induced barrier lowering from the barrier model. Uh, yeah, yeah this, is, this is showing those hot carrier effects perhaps, you know, stress uh, by running it hard. The, the hot carrier effects are breaking bonds, building up charge, and it kind of creates a permanent damage, a permanent skew in the threshold voltage. Um, Here's the dibble. So when you see this, this is actually better, a version of it, uh, where it shows long channel, the barrier comes up and it's nice and, and robust. But when it gets shorter and shorter and shorter, this lowers because of the electrostatic coupling of the two. This actually shows you, so that is considered the amount of dibble when you want to short channel. And uh, so, Sure. We didn't talk about shear charge. We didn't get a chance. Uh, bigger picture. Yeah, this is the inverter. This is why the PMOS maybe has to be twice as large as the NMOS in older versions of uh, uh, technologies because they have to be matched. We're, we're ramping this up to the VDD power supply, and then we want this to ground. And we don't never want both transistors to be on because that would short everything out and would burn up my battery, right? I want either this transistor to be on or this transistor to be on. And if this is on, then that creates a short circuit. I was, I was learning this, uh, you know, this is 3020. You should have learned this. Uh, if you haven't yet, you know, you will. When this is on, basically it shorts VDD to V out. 
right? So uh, that, that changes what the V-out voltage is. When this is on, this shorts V-out to ground, and so this goes to zero, or this goes to VDD as zero one. So this is toggling between one and zero, depending upon which transistor is being on. That's all it is, it's an inverter. So, yeah, they have to be matched. So I might need to make that PMOS bigger to electrically match the two. And this is the trans transfer characteristics. Um, so how do you make them? You're going to make them uh, on the same chip because you might have a P-tub through diffusion. And I might make the, uh, the P-tub, I'm going to make an NMOS. And with an N-tub, I'm going to make a PMOS. Remember, it goes the opposite way. And so therefore, I can make two two transistors on the same chip of the two different electrical flavors. Yeah, here's another. You see the PMOS and the NMOS. This is the way uh, scaled CMOS is starting to look. The gate is starting to look like a mushroom and, um, and uh, so forth. Uh, I eventually showed you that, yeah, and Really, in the big picture, often the transistor is not the rate-limiting step. It's all the interconnect wires. That really tends to be the rate-limiting step. All the, the, the delays in sending it through all these wires. To, to be able to connect up the entire microprocessor, you need, uh, now it's up to seven levels. This is only showing you five levels. And so it's usually the interconnects, the, the rate-limiting step. And uh, this is the source of your... Uh, flash memory, by the way, non-viable memory. So this is, you're, you're putting charge on a floating gate, and so that's, uh, you're changing the, you're essentially changing the threshold voltage. When you write, uh, you know, your, your computer problem to your flash drive and take it home and email it to the TA, you know, you're, you're basically putting charge into the, into the, the gates and just shifting the threshold voltage. That's how you stored the ones and zeros. Um, so here you see uh, poly, uh, this is this is polysilicon. This is the type of transistors we put on glass to be able to run a uh, display, a liquid crystal display. So it's polysilicon. That was why I emphasized the difference between epitaxy and deposition because I put polysilicon onto glass and and actually it's amorphous silicon and then I maybe laser anneal it to convert it into poly. And then this is usually called a thin film transistor, but it's basically a FET. And here's DRAM. So if you have, you know, if you say uh, buy, uh, you, you upgrade your PC, and I want to put uh, uh, 64 gigs of uh, uh, RAM in my in my PC, right? You're putting in DRAM. You got local memory through SRAM. You got uh, uh, neighborhood memory from the DRAM, and then you have the hard drive memory for, for latent uh, storage. And, yeah. And so then I kind of, with all that basic physics, you can start to see how this is uh, working. How are you going into thin FETs for better electrostatic control? How are you wanting to maybe uh, jettison silicon and go to a hybrid where you have? Uh, a 3.5 channel material with high mobility for the NMOS, and you have germanium as the PMOS. So I want you to kind of understand these stories a little bit. Uh, uh, vertical, t this is a tunnel field effect transistor. Now you see the merit in tunneling. I can exceed this, the sub-threshold slope by tunneling in. And so we can have all these things. Here's even more, if you, if you get better electrostatic control by putting the gate over the top and being on three sides, won't be better if you surround it, all gate all around, and you can really uh, have electrostatic control. Okay, and the only last thing I'll talk about, because the midterm one and midterm two were covered on previous, is the heart of a bipolar. Understand this story. I know that we um, lost class due to the tragedy on Monday. And we only had, so far, uh, Wednesday's lecture, and I'm going to back clean up on Friday, which will be our last lecture. But this is really the heart of a bipolar. Please understand this story. Um, understand how it's just basically two p-n junctions. You understand p-n junctions. You should understand p-n junctions. Right? Uh, in a gain 
operating as gain, this is in forward bias, this is in reverse bias. So I'm sending four bias holes on my P plus N. P plus is uh, there on purpose because it's higher doped. So therefore, there's an asymmetric uh, current controlled by forward uh, going holes and backward going electrons. I want it to be asymmetric. I want it to be hole dominated. Um, and the holes going across this gauntlet, this is going through the ele uh, electron rich base. Some of them are lost due to uh, recombination. We expect that. If this distance is long enough, they exceed their diffusion length and they're going to be lost. And so then the base current is mostly taken up by resupplying electrons from the circuit to replace the electrons lost to recombination. So that's how it works. I have holes that do not pass go uh, and go right to the collector and some are lost. You know, it's like that red rover, red rover, send my hole over, right? And so they're, they're coming across and some are being lost, right? And so this I um, maybe don't want, but this is the trigger point for why the bipolar exhibits gain. Because electrostatically, if I stop the supply of electrons that replace the lost electrons, then this base starts to become electron poor. And if it's electron poor, you understand the, the, the dynamics of Gauss's law and electrostatics. If this becomes electron poor, then the bias across this metallurgical junction has to shift because I'm, I'm changing the, the, the boundary conditions. So therefore, the PN junction starts to unbias Right? So therefore, the PN junction is, is the internally, the PN junction four bias is being valved down, and, and eventually, the, basically, the base is saying, don't send any more holes. I cannot accommodate them. And so then, a small electron current is modulating a large hole current. And that is the basis of the gain. It's the ratio of this small electron current and the large hole current. You basically take the whole current divided by the electron current. And that's the ratio. Um, and so here you, you see it. Uh, so it's basically those. Um, what's another takeaway? We kind of had limited time to go over. And I think that's the main thing. It's the, it's the two PN junctions that are coincident, and it's the carriers coming over the four biased and, and, and being collected. In fact, let me sh pull up one that's in bias. Uh, yeah, here's in bias. Well, this is a this is a PNP, and I think everyone kind of struggles with the uh, holes. Let me see. Don't we have an NPN? Do you want to more common in the industry? Uh, it depends. Where's an NPN? I want a band diagram. I want a band diagram. Likes PNP. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna you're gonna uh, basically because we're running out of runway in this semester. There's a lot of this. So it's it, it's going to be off limits. Um, yeah. I want a good killer band diagram. I love band diagrams. Uh, well, one thing I may talk about tomorrow, uh, by the way, in a, in a bipolar transistor, uh, it's, it's now becomes that cur uh, the dependent current source is now a current dependent current source. It's going to be dependent upon the, um, really it's the base current is going to be, uh, here it says VEB, but really that's, that's controlling the, uh, uh, the, the, the current. Um, and yeah, so here's the band diagram. This is, happens to be a heterojunction, which is one thing I'll just give you a foreshadowing. I'm going to uh, for sure talk about this tomorrow because here is a homojunction, so say all silicon. So I'm going to have my carriers coming over the top, bounded by my sail, coming over the top. Remember, see how this uh, bipolar actually mimics the FET? It's the same barrier. That's for that's that's not on uh, by coincidence. 
And so this is coming over, and then as they come here, they, they're going to fall under the, the electric field, right? So they've got to get across this gauntlet and fall. But remember, for a good bipolar, we wanted to have a dominance of, of electrons coming in, in this case, uh, with few holes being back injected. So when I make a heterojunction, where I have aluminum gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, or something like that, then I can make the band offset where I have a lower barrier for electrons to come this way and a larger barrier for holes to go this way. So this is a way I can actually make a high-end bipolar. Okay, so that's pretty much, uh, that's a foreshadowing of tomorrow's lecture, but it will be, uh, that, that'll be something testable. I'm for sure going to cover this tomorrow. Let me open up the floor. I did not cover anything on midterm one because I do have a videotape up on YouTube for that. I did not cover anything on midterm two because I have videotape for that. But here's an opportunity for you to ask me questions. So the BJT Tesla material will be whatever we get up to at the end of Friday. Precisely. Yes. It's not. Uh, yeah. I can't. Can't. Uh, I, I like to teach it myself, so I'm to, to say, to task you to go read the book and, and test you on it, I don't think is, I see myself as your tour guide, right? <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, like uh, you know, uh, trying to, to, to bring you through all this information and, and, and lead you through and to tell you the highlights. Don. So you mentioned on Monday, uh, not on Monday, on Wednesday, um, the, uh, the actually, event. actually, it was two Mondays ago. Well, oh, Wednesday, yeah, Monday, yeah, 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 that Wednesday, that Wednesday. Yeah. Um, I was thinking Thanksgiving. Um, you mentioned the early effect and how it slopes upward. Uh, that's a very good point. That is a t that is actually a very testable point. Uh, the early effect, where you can either have the channel width modulation of a field effect. We use the same term, by the way, for bipolars as we do for field effect transistors. And so that is, where's the early effect? This is the early effect. It's where the, the uh, neutral base is, is shrinking. And so therefore, these carriers have a shorter distance to go. So as I bias it more, then I actually get more current out because of the, 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 because it's a shorter distance. And the same happens in the field effect transistor, remember? Because the field effect transistor has the same, uh, let me get rid of this. Remember, when you pass pinch off, um, When you pass pinch off, this is the uh, the, the 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 nominal gate uh, uh, length, but then it becomes sort of prime from here once I've exceeded pinch off. Right, just do the source and the drain and so forth. And so when that pinch off happens and, and it comes back, this has effectively modified my gate length, and so the, they both manifest as having IV characteristics that slope. And they all tend to extrapolate to an early voltage. Yes, whether you're bipolar or uh, field effect transistor. And again, that is actually an Ohio State alum, James Early. I looked. At, I checked on Wikipedia. He actually does, the, the, the Wikipedia doesn't say Ohio State. So, any of you have editorial rights on uh, Wikipedia? Maybe you want to add that. Okay, questions? Thank you, Donna. That's a, that was a good point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, for the earlier fact, uh, can I say that? Um, Beyond some point, the resistance of the gate is constant. It doesn't change anymore. No, you, uh, you want us to talk about it in the terms of base width modulation or channel, channel length modulation. 
You want to be talking about how it's, 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 it's shrinking with the application of bias. And it's more pronounced when you go to smaller devices. If this, if this was a huge device, five microns long, then this small to the, uh, perturbation on the depletion is minuscule. It, this this uh, early effect really starts to become prominent as you make smaller devices. Given studies, uh, are we characteristic graph? So I thought it would be resistance. Uh, no, no. Base width modulation or channel length modulation would be the killer. Put those three terms, and you're going to get majority points. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.